And now we're going to have three lectures uh, that are uh, bench to bedside on the topic of HER2 and ER crosstalk. The first one will be by Dr. Rachel Schiff, who is professor at Baylor College of Medicine. The title of her talk is Oncogene Signal Transduction and Antiestrogen Resistance. Rachel? Thank you, Carlos, for the invitation. It is a true honor for me to talk today and be part of this symposium that honors Dr. Osborne. Whereas Carlos just said, in the context of HER2 and ER crosstalk, I will discuss oncogene signal transduction and anti-estrogen as well as anti-HER2 therapy resistance. These are my disclosures. I believe that endocrine resistance is still an evolving field, but an emerging theme that we have recognized many years ago and have studied for the past 20 plus years is that estrogen receptor plasticity is key for multiple different forms of endocrine resistance. And estrogen receptor plasticity consists of changes to its levels, variants, intracellular localization, post-translational modifications, and importantly, genomic aberration, aberrations to its gene. And one needs to realize that all these features leads to altered activity of the estrogen receptor, meaning that on one hand, it can remain active in, in, even in the presence of endocrine agents, but not less important as a transcription factor it can, only bind, it, can, it can also bind there to other elements on the DNA, on the chromatin, to activate different sets of genes. And this is a phenomenon, phenomenon which is known as transcriptional reprogramming. And you will hear more about it in the next talk. And what our studies showed, that there are major two groups of proteins that via multi-directional crosstalk can modulate or re regulate this ER plasticity, and those are gross factor receptors and their downstream oncogenic signaling, as well as ER co-regulators and other transcription factors. And I will refer from now on to these two groups as nodes. And importantly, genes that con constitute these two nodes have recently been shown, along with the genomic aberrations in ESR1, to be among the main enriched altered pathways or genes in post-endocrine therapy tumors, mostly in the advanced setting, as had recently been reported by Razavi et al. And they further showed that there is a mutual exclusivity of mutations in these genes in comparison or with ESR1 mutations, suggesting that these are indeed independent drivers of resistance. And for the rest of the talk, I'm going to discuss molecular mechanisms by which this crosstalk of these two nodes with the estrogen receptor pathway alters its activity and what are the clinic clinical implications for treatment resistance. And I will start with the first node of gross factor receptors and their downstream oncogenic signaling, where this regulation of these gross factor receptors and downstream kinesis pathways via aberrations in the hair family receptors and FGFR receptors that can be in activating mutations, amplifications, and other, as well as, as, well as PS3 kinase and MAP kinase independent pathway alterations, including their tumor suppressor genes, can provide alternative survival and growth signaling to these tumors via their own signaling pathway to evade estrogen receptor blockade. But not less important, via the this hyper gross factor signaling and the downstream kinases, via an intimate crosstalk with the estrogen receptor pathway, for example, via phosphorylation of the estrogen receptor itself, itself as well as it, its co-regulators, can lead to altered estrogen receptor activities in to support endocrine resistance and transcriptional reprogramming associated with more aggressive phenotype, phenotypes such as metastatic phenotypes. And at the same time, this crosstalk also leads to decrease in estrogen receptor levels, 
And indeed, the degree of overexpression of HER2 is inversely, inversely correlated with estrogen receptor expression, and this is mostly true for, a, for HER2 positive tumors. And we and others have shown that HER2 inhibition can repress, I'm sorry, that HER2 overexpression inhibits ER expression via its downstream kinases, PS3 kinase AKT, and MAP kinase. And conversely, ER in inhibits HER2 expression via other reported mechanisms. So the, the important message here is that while HER2 activates and alters ER function, it decreases ER level and its classic activity. And what that means is the, activ the activation of classic estrogen-stimulated genes such as BCL2, IGFR, and progesterone receptor. And that probably can partly explain the biology and the clinical behavior of ER-positive PR-negative tumors. So the main questions that we ask from these scenarios is first, if HER2 down-regulated ER, does black inner 2 increase ER levels? And can ER then be the mechanism of resistance to HER2 blockade? And conversely, if ER down regulates HER2, does blocking ER can increase HER levels? And can these hair increased HER levels be a mechanism for resistance to, a HER2, to ER blockade? And to answer these questions, we used multiple clinical uh, preclinical trials as well as clinical specimens. For simplicity, I will focus only on one model today, and that has been first reported 30 years ago. In what you can see that ER positive MCF7 breast cancer cells, when they grow in mice as tumors, they are first sensitive to tamoxifen, but eventually acquired resistance. However, when these cells were engineered to overexpress HER2, the tumors are de novo resistant to tamoxifen. We later showed that they are also stimulated by tamoxifen and only transiently inhibited by estrogen deprivation. So how one can overcome this endocrine resistance in HER2 positive ER positive tumors? And what we have shown is that complete blockade of the HER pathway with either dual, uh, triple or dual blockade is needed to block all different signaling that can stem from the, the receptor layer, if you will, or the different four receptors. And that needs to be along with endocrine therapy, such as tamoxifen or estrogen deprivation that is shown here, and that can lead into complete tumor eradication. And these are important observations with a lot of clinical implications. However, if we give the same potent HER2 blockade in the presence of, estro of estrogen, these tumors are almost de novo resistance. So briefly look into does blocking HER2 increase ER levels and also in clinical specimens, can ER be the mechanism for resistance to, to HER2 blockade? First, you can see here that ER expression is indeed decreased in HER2 positive breast cancer xenografts and that hair inhibition with either the triple or the dual blockade enhances its expression, which was associated with increased PR, BCL2, and IGFR expression. We further showed in these models that resistance to estrogen deprivation is associated with complete loss of the estrogen receptor expression, and that tumor response to HER2 inhib inhibition, as shown here, which we find in about 50% of the tumors, was associated with increased levels of estrogen expression. And finally, to look into clinical specimens, we found that neoadjuvant treatment with lapatinib in patients with HER2-positive breast cancer resulted in rapid, act rapid activation of both estrogen receptor as well as BCL2 levels. And these increased BCL2 levels were associated with ER positivity, including in three tumors that converted from ER negative to ER positive. And the last question on this set of questions is, does blocking ER can increase HER2 levels in ER-positive HER2 negative tumors? So we went back to our parental cells and showed that indeed acquired resistance to tamoxifen was associated with increased levels of EGFR or HER1 as well as HER2. And while estrogen receptor continues to play a role in this model, these increased levels of hair signaling and expression was important and was the mechanism of resistance as adding, as adding gefitinib, which is an EGFR inhibitor, 
delayed significantly tamoxifen-resistant onset in this model. Finally, let me briefly look into the other node, and these are estrogen receptor co-regulators. And as you probably know, those can be activated via co co-activators can be activated via activating mutations or amplifications such as in SR3 or a FOXA1, and inhibiting mutation of a RID1A or NF1 can, lead it for, can increase, decrease the activity or levels of these core repressors, which will lead into an imbalance in those levels and activities, with an excess activity of co-activators that will allow now those to be recruited to, re to the receptor to activate gene even in the presence of endocrine agency, a agents look, look, leading into endocrine resistance. But not less important, there is also intimate crosstalk bidirectional between the estrogen receptor co-regulators co themselves and growth factor receptors. And we and others have shown that hypersignaling or levels by different co-activators, for example, FOXA1, which is a very important pioneer factor for the estrogen receptor pathway, can lead into activation of multiple different growth factor receptors, including HER2. And independently, hypergrowth factor signaling via their downstream kinases can phosphorylate and activate co-activators and phosphorylate and inactivate co-repressors that are going through nuclear export to again lead to excess activity of co-activators and endocrine resistance. And is it important clinically? Indeed, the answer is yes. And we have shown that only these tumors that have high levels of SRC3 as well as high levels of HER2 are the resistant tumors to tamoxifen adjuvant therapy, and John Bartlett have also shown similar data in other cohorts. So in summary, I believe that crosstalk between ER, HER2, and its downstream signaling and ER co-regulators impacts treatment resistance. And this crosstalk alters levels and activity of ER and its co-regulators, resulting in endocrine resistance and transcriptional reprogramming associated with more aggressive metastatic propensities. Due to this ER HER2 crosstalk, blocking one of these receptors leads to the activation of the other as a mechanism of resistance to the respective ther therapies, suggesting that one need to check on the, their levels. In HER2 positive, ER positive, complete HER2 blockade plus endocrine therapy is needed and in many tumors even is sufficient for tumor eradication. And finally, I think that the take home message is that estrogen receptor plasticity and endocrine resistance are multifaceted and context specific, which need to be identified and monitored for precision therapeutic interventions which lead me to suggest that additional studies to identify convergent mechanism that can offer common effective new strategies to overcome this endocrine resistance stemming from so many multiple upstream nodes are warranted. And one of those that we are suggest is AP1 blockade, perhaps together with the new generation endocrine agents. And you will hear, you will hear more why about it in the next talk. And finally, I would like to acknowledge and thank all current and former lab members, members of all our collaborative teams within and outside Baylor, our finding agencies, and most important, all the patients and their families. And on a more personal note, I started my career as Kent's postdoctoral fellow and became a colleague. Throughout all these years, I was amazed by Kent's leadership, vision, and dedication in building successful large programs around healthcare, clinical and, and basic research, as well as translational research, training, education, and other, including this symposium. So I would like to take the advantage of this opportunity to loudly thank him, perhaps on behalf of many of us in this room. Thank you, Kent, and thank you all for your attention. Thank you, uh, Dr. Schiff. We have uh, time for questions. I'll start with one. Um, it's fascinating to see this yin yang between a transcription factor, estrogen receptor, and a receptor tyrosine kinase. So, um, can you remind us whether the same happens if you use not estrogen suppression or tamoxifen, whether the same happens if you use full vestrant or a SERD? 
would you see the same feedback to her too? Yes, actually we see highest even with full vestant in multiple models. Okay, at least for her too. Okay, all right. With other with other un, uh, ER blockers, ER and we looked into that and the astrogenica also. Okay. The previous one, not the new one. Okay, thank. So, microphone number three. Yes. And then. <coughs> um, her two overexpression. Uh, inhibits ER activity, and HER2 blockade uh, prevents that. So my question is a clinical question, and that is for patients who've got HER2 positive breast cancer, once a year's worth of anti-HER2 therapy is completed, is there any point in continuing with adjuvant endocrine therapy? Yes. You're asking an MD, which is a mouse doctor, but I will answer you that I believe the answer is yes. And I think that it's still controversial in the metastatic disease, but all data, at least preclinically, and I think that a lot of them, if you look carefully clinically, suggest that the answer is yes. And I think that in some patients, certainly all the others more fragile in the metastatic setting, the combination, even without chemotherapy, may be sufficient, at least for a while. The third presentation by Dr. Johnston will cover that extensively. Yes. So we'll go back to your question. Microphone number four. Uh, uh, this is Yi Li from Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, Rachel, that was a great talk. I have a question that may be more relevant to, uh, to the mouse doctor. So um, you said about uh, anti-estrogen therapy leading to uh, e, uh, HER2 of expression in your models. So I wonder at a me mechanistic level, how does that might happen? Because I didn't say that because I didn't have time. So there are not a lot which is known about it, but there are set of uh, microRNAs that target HER2, which are stimulated by estrogen. So if you block them, they're downregulated and HER2 comes back. There are other mechanisms that had been, that had been shown by Miles Brown, and Jason Carroll showed that there are squelching of transcription factor by, factors by the estrogen receptor, which are critical to activate HER2. One of them is PAX2, another one is SRC3, but there are some others. Okay, thank you very much. I don't see any more questions. Thank you, uh, Dr. Schiff.